Well, good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's Money Matters Workshop, an introduction to home ownership. My name is Kimberly Prime, Director of Constituent Services and Community Partnerships for Howard County Executive Calvin Ball. Before we get to our presenters, just a few housekeeping items. Tonight's meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to our Money Matters website for those that were unable to join us or if you would like to watch at a later time. You can find the video along with all of our other Money Matters workshops we're hosting throughout the month of April at www.howardcountymd.gov slash money matters. We will also, we have also provided a sign language interpreter, which you should see at the top of your screen. During the presentation, if you have any questions, we kindly ask that you place it in the chat box located in the lower right corner of your screen. Following their presentation, our speakers will have the opportunity to answer them. At this time, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Michael Bosch. Michael is a mortgage loan originator based out of Columbia, Maryland. His approach to mortgage planning, knack for customer service, and knowledge of local and non-local mortgage programs create a world-class client experience. His goal is to help long-term wealth creation. As a Howard County native, Michael provides valuable insight that you will not find elsewhere. When he is not working, you can find him riding his mountain bike, enjoying live music, or frequenting local restaurants. Michael, I'll now turn things over to you. Hey, thank you so much, Kim. Um, uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank everybody for having me on this presentation today. Um, really a big fan of Money Matters. Uh, I wish we could be doing this live in person, and I'm so glad that you were able to put this together on a web event. I know a lot of time and effort goes into that, so I just want to applaud everybody who was able to make this happen today. Um, so, just want to start out by giving you a, an old proverb here. So, when I started out in the mortgage industry, my first manager came up to me and said, Mike, do you know when the best time to plant a tree is? And I sat there and I thought, I thought, okay, I, I'm in finance. I didn't get into growing trees, but I'll entertain this question. I said, spring because that seemed to make sense. It was after winter. And he looked at me, he said, nope. And I said, what's the answer? He said, 30 years ago, because if you had planted that seed 30 years ago, you would have a fully grown tree by now. So I bring that example up because the average term of a mortgage loan is 30 years, meaning if I had bought a home 30 years ago, I would now own a home free and clear. Home ownership is one of the best pathways to financial growth. Um, I just want to share with you before we really get started some statistics about average home growth. So, in the USA, conservatively, homes appreciate by three and a half percent year over year. So that means after thirty years, you'd be looking at a one hundred and five percent increase in the value of your home. That means if you were to buy a half million dollar home today and do nothing but pay your mortgage on time for the next 30 years, your net worth would be seven figures in 2051. Now, I know it seems like a long time away, but now is the best time to start planting that seed. You know, I constantly hear people saying things like, I wish I invested in Apple back in the 80s or Amazon in 97 or bought Bitcoin when it was was cheap. And I look at these people and I, I say, you know, sure, we missed the boat on those amazing opportunities, but what are, what type of seeds are you planting today to help create long term wealth? And home ownership is, is truly, in my opinion, the best way to do that. So the goal of this presentation today is really to educate you about the home buying process, provide some insight and some guidance on how to prepare yourself and to give you a contact. As you see, I have my information up here. You're more than welcome to text or email out, um, you know, for me to personally help you along with everything. So the company I work for here is First Home Mortgage. Um, we are the number one lender in the state of Maryland for purchase loans. Um, what makes us different is our personalized service, which allows us to really understand your financial needs. 
and your short and long-term plans. Um, I say this because no two people's financial situation is the same. No two people's five year, 10 year, 15, 20, et cetera, plan is the same. Um, you know, as far as our company goes, we close our loans on time, which is very important when it comes to a purchase transaction, as there's contractual obligations, there's a, you who would be the buyer, there's a seller, there's the attorneys involved at the title company and the realtors. So being able to meet deadlines is how you create a stellar reputation and, you know, satisfy all your clients needs. Um, we've been doing this as a company for over 25 years and plan to do it for a, a very long time more. So let's dive into some of the different types of loan products that are available. Um, we have your conventional loans. We have your government loans. The most typical loans that you are going to see as a first time home buyer are going to be your conventional loan or your FHA loan. Now, one of the biggest myths that's still floating out there, and I don't understand how this myth is still out there, is that you need 20% down to buy a home. Um, that's simply not true. With a conventional loan, the minimum barrier to entry is a 3% down payment. With an FHA loan, you can go with as low as 3.5% as your down payment. Um, there are also a wide variety of programs to help you cover that initial down payment investment and actually allow you to purchase a home without making any down payment. Now, your VA loan is for veterans or uh, active duty service members. Uh, that is a privilege that they've earned for their military service. Those loans do not require a down payment at all. There's also a USDA loan, which is available on specific houses in rural areas. Those loans also do not require a down payment. Um, so if you're in that mindset that you have to save up 20% to get into the housing market, please, please erase that because there are so many different ways to get into a home. Um, and I'm happy to, to help you explore all those avenues. As far as other loan products you see on here, renovation and construction, second homes, investment properties, refinancing, those are a little bit less typical to a first time home buyer. However, the exhibit I presented at the beginning with the long term wealth creation would allow you an opportunity to pull equity out of your primary home, perhaps use that as a down payment towards an investment property or a second home after you build equity in that home. So let's kind of go through the purchasing process from start to finish. So back in the pre-internet days, you would typically go to your bank first, you would get pre-approved, they would recommend you to a realtor who knew all of the houses coming on the market, and they would take you out to see houses in your price range. Now, with the rise of the internet, the tech boom, the Zillows, the Redfins, the Realtor.coms, a lot of people have gotten into a backwards mindset where they find the house online by themselves, then they find a realtor, they want to make an offer, but they haven't spoken to a lender, and they don't have a pre-qualification, which you need to offer on a home. So let me walk you through the optimal way to home shop. So you wanna start out by talking to a lender like myself and go through what's called a pre-qualification. Now, there are a lot of specified guidelines that we as a mortgage lender have to adhere to. And it's my job to look through your financial scenario and see how you fit into those guidelines and how we can work to get you the monthly payment and the loan amount that you are seeking. So a pre-qualification is really based off of three major components, your income, your credit, and your assets. Those are the three main ingredients that make up a mortgage qualification. So we are gonna look at how much money you make per year. We're gonna look at your credit score and what liabilities you're obligated to pay on credit. And we're gonna look at your assets, what you have set aside for down payment 
and closing costs. What you have in reserves, say you were to lose your job, God forbid, what type of money you have set aside to help you, you know, keep making that mortgage payment in that scenario, which I'm sure a lot of folks, maybe even some of you out there at, have experience with this past COVID year, which has been, been tough on everybody. So once we go through that process, I'm able to issue what's called a pre-approval letter. The difference between a pre-qualification and a pre-approval is reviewing of your documents. So a pre-qualification is based more off of a verbal conversation and a credit poll, as or a pre-approval means that I've reviewed your W-2s, your tax returns, your pay stubs, your bank statements, I've verified your assets. That way, when you take that pre-approval letter over to the seller and you place your offer, they know that you're good to go. They know that the lender has fully vetted you and they know that you have all your documents prepared to make the loan process as quick as possible. Now, from the day your offer is accepted to the day you get the keys to your home is typically 30 to 45 days. So let's go over the process that happens within that time frame. So we've already gone through the pre-qualification and pre-approval. Once your offer gets accepted, we're gonna to go to loan preparation. I'm gonna to put together a formal estimate for you, which is gonna break down all of your closing costs, as well as what your monthly payment is going to look like. And it will have an estimated figure for you, what we call your total cash to close. That's the total amount of money you are gonna to have to bring to the table to purchase that home. Typically speaking in Maryland, you're looking at between three and 4% of the purchase price as your closing costs. And again, the minimum barrier to entry for down payment, three to three and a half percent. So if you have seven to seven and a half percent of your purchase price set aside, you're probably in a good place as far as assets go to purchase a home. Again, there's down payment assistance, which I'm not gonna get too deep into during this part of the presentation. Once we go through your loan estimate, I'm gonna submit your file to processing and your processor is gonna take over as the back end process proceeds. Their duty is to organize your entire file, update any financial documents that need to be updated and submit your file to the underwriting department. The underwriters are gonna go through and review everything from top to bottom and they will be the ones that issue the final loan approval. Once your loan is approved, I'll send you out what's called a closing disclosure, which is similar to your loan estimate, but the numbers are gonna be the actual numbers at that point, rather than the ballpark figures. Once we walk through your closing disclosure, our closing department will speak with the title company who is also involved in the transaction. Those are the attorneys that are gonna move the money around. They're gonna transfer ownership from the sellers to you, the buyer, and ultimately get you the keys to your home on closing day, which is exhibit number six here. So on your scheduled closing day, you will drive over to the title company that we have selected at the beginning of the process. You'll sign through all your documents. You'll review that closing disclosure again that is when you will get the keys to your house. Uh, of course, the day before closing or the morning of closing, you're typically going to go to your bank and you're either going to get a certified check or you're going to wire those funds to the title company for your closing costs. So that is kind of the mortgage process from top to bottom in a nutshell. Um, let's talk a little bit about credit because with most buyers, that's kind of a hot button topic. Where does your credit need to be? How can you improve your credit? A lot of people ask me, what's your minimum threshold of credit to purchase a house? Realistically speaking, you don't want to be on the minimum end of the credit if you can avoid it. Um, there is flexibility as far as everything goes and everyone's situation is different. But if I can empower you right now with some knowledge to start improving your credit, it's going to strengthen your file. It may make you eligible for more programs and bring your interest rate down, which will result in a lower monthly payment. 
So something I hear every single day when I talk about credit is my credit karma score is X number. A credit karma and a mortgage inquiry, I've never seen them be the same exact number. I've seen them be in the same ballpark. I've seen it be up to 200 points more or 200 points less, which is a ridiculous swing. What we do as a mortgage lender and any mortgage lender is going to do is do a tri merge hard pull of your credit. We're going to get your Equifax, your Experian, and your TransUnion score. And the middle of the three scores will be your qualifying score. So if you're looking to buy a home in the next six to 12 months, maybe even the next two years, yes, you can start working on your credit yourself, but I highly recommend speaking with myself or another licensed loan originator that can help walk you through item by item and create a success plan for you. I wouldn't recommend Google and credit repair. There's a lot of really shady companies out there that do not have your best intention in mind. Um, but a licensed loan originator is almost always going to have your best interests in mind as far as helping your credit goes. Some general guidance for you, and this, this is probably the top piece I get, is about utilization. So utilization is going to be how much credit you've used versus your maximum credit limit. So let's use a credit card as an example. Let's say I have a Chase credit card and my maximum limit is $1,000. To keep my credit in the best place possible, I'm not gonna wanna exceed 30% of that maximum. I'm going to wanna keep my card at $300 or less. Often you can go as high as 50% without it really hurting your credit, but 30% or lower is really gonna be that sweet spot. So something I do with a lot of clients as I walk them through their credit report is I help them analyze their maximum amounts and I figure out ways to automatically build their credit. And what do I mean by that? I mean, what recurring expenses do you have that you could assign to a credit card? Let's say you have a $500 max on a credit card. Your car insurance payment is $120. Great. Auto pay your car insurance on that credit card. Don't put anything else on that. Set your bank account to automatically pay that credit card off. If you can run those calculations on all of your different cards, you can really set yourself up to build your credit over time. Uh, if you go to annualcreditreport.com, I'll say that one more time, annualcreditreport.com, you can once a year request a copy of all three of your credit reports. It will not give you your scores, but it will give you all your trade lines so you can do some analysis yourself. Like I said, I'm more than happy to do an analysis with you and walk you through and help you create your own success plan if you do want the help of a professional. Um, keep old accounts open, closing down accounts you don't use typically as a negative effect. Um, don't allow credit inquiries if it's not necessary. A hard pull only makes up about 5% of your overall credit score. So it's not the most detrimental thing to your credit score. But if you're in the market to buy a house and you're checking out at Macy's and they say, hey, apply for a credit card, we'll give you 5% off. Maybe a good idea to hold off on that until you achieve your larger financial goals, just to protect your credit score and keep it as high as possible. Don't open unnecessary lines of credit. If you're someone that has no credit right now, you will have to open credit to establish it. But if you have 10 credit cards out, an 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th credit card, it's probably going to do more harm than it's going to do good. This last one goes without saying, make your payments on time. Missing even one payment on a credit card or a student loan can really, really hurt your credit. Um, so that's just some guidance. I really hope that helps everybody out there. Anybody who, whose credit isn't, you know, exactly where you want it to be. Um, for down payment assistance program, 660 is where the minimum mark is at right now, uh, as far as everything goes. So that could maybe serve as a baseline. Although I, I really recommend trying to get to at least a 700 to be in, in a strong spot for a home purchase. 
So let's talk about your down payment options. Down payments can come from many places. One place they can't come from is cash under your bed. You can't walk into the title company with a briefcase full of $100 bills. Um, so, you know, it, it's important to get that money into your bank account and let it season in there. Uh, liquid assets come from your checking or savings. If you have an IRA or a 401k, if you're a government worker or military, you may have a TSP, a thrift savings plan. Um, you can often borrow against those accounts, sometimes pull without penalty. You will have to reach out directly to the company that holds those funds to figure out those terms. Um, but yeah, 401k is a great, great way to take out money to use towards down payment and closing costs. Government assistance. Like I said, there's a wide variety of down payment assistance available. Maryland Mortgage Program is good in every county of Maryland. SDLP program uh, specific to Howard County, got to be the best down payment assistance program I've ever seen in my life. I see Quinita smiling on that because she knows. Um, and then there's gift funds as well, um, which has to be from uh, from a relative, you know, parent, brother, sister, cousin. Um, again, you're going to want them to have that, that money seasoned in that bank account. Um, you often have to source their bank statements when doing that. So that's part of a conversation you want to have with them. And before you transfer any funds over, you should speak with your loan officer before moving any amounts of money around, uh, which leads us to avoiding mortgage sabotage. Number one, don't move your cash and savings around. Number two, verify large deposits. If you deposit 15,000 in cash and you can't provide where the money came from say you sold a car you need a you know a receipt of sale that if you can't provide where the money came from that money's not going to uh, immediately qualify um so that's why you document the selling of assets when you're in the moving process don't pack your financial papers like i said you need a lot of financial documents you're going to continue to need them throughout the mortgage process don't quit your job. Don't change your job. If that's something you're thinking about doing, you better tell your loan officer ahead of time. Uh, if if you don't have your job at the time of closing, we're going to have to verify your employment. They say you don't work there. You no longer have qualifying income. Um, again, ask your loan originator about accepting gifts and become a paper hound. You're going to want to hold on to all sorts of documents, your bank statements, your pay stubs, You'll get the gist of it once you go through the pre-approval process, but you're going to want to be on the front end of that. You're on a tight deadline when you're in a home purchase. So very important to become a paper hound. I already said, do not apply for new credit and review your credit report. Really important. Start doing that now um, if you're not completely satisfied with where your overall credit is. So here's some of the, the uh, commonly required items. Social Security number, two years of your address. Sometimes we need two year history from your landlord. Uh, Going to need the name of your employer, your W 2s for the past two years, 30 days, most recent pay stubs. If you own other homes, we, we're going to need information on the payments for those homes. If you have other loans, we're going to need information for that. If you're on an IRS repayment plan for back taxes, we're going to need that. Uh, a lot of paperwork, which is why I say become a paper hound. Um, once your file gets into processing, you're going to get a homeowner's insurance policy. You're going to, again, provide updated documents. A processor is going to order your appraisal. An appraisal will be done on the house to determine the value. Order the IRS transcripts. Make sure that your homeowner's insurance policy is activated. Okay, they're going to verify your employment, which is why if you quit your job, Lender's going to find out as part of the underwriting process. And if you don't have income, you will not be eligible for the loan. They're also going to go through your credit report and double check all your income documents to make sure everything's correct. As far as costs paid prior to closing on your home, when you do make an offer, you put up what's called an earnest money deposit. Um, basically, if you decided to back out of the transaction because you don't want to buy the house anymore that's a deposit for the seller to keep if you imagine you were selling your home and someone was planning to buy it 
And then in the final hour, they said, I changed my mind. What kind of a hassle would that be to you? You now have another mortgage payment. You have to put your house back on the market. So that earnest money deposit is there to show good faith on your end. And again, just to protect the seller in the case that you choose to back out of it. Um, you may get a home inspection. VA loans require a termite inspection. You may want to get it on your own. Lead-based paint hazards, radon inspection, well and septic if you're uh, out in more of a rural area, and uh, really any other inspections that your realtor deems appropriate. Uh, that's typically more of the realtor's aspect than the mortgage lender's aspect. Again, I kind of already went over the loan estimate and what that's going to entail. And I have about two minutes left here before Quinny takes the floor. So I'm going to kind of rush through these last couple slides here. Your closing disclosure, uh, again, is similar to that loan estimate, just with the finalized numbers. As loan originators, we do our darn best job to get the loan estimate as accurate as possible. I always try to estimate on the high end, not the low end, so that if you have surprises, they're pleasant surprises, not unpleasant surprises. Here's kind of a list of everything that's going to be in your closing costs, loan costs, cash to close, summaries of the transaction, payment table, interest rate. Um, any required legal disclosures, and of course, we'll have you confirm the receipt of that. You will again sign the closing disclosure on the day of settlement with the attorneys, the note, which is your promise to repay your mortgage loan, and on the deed of trust slash mortgage, which is going to secure you to that home. Make sure you bring your driver's license to settlement the day that you close. Make sure it's not expired either. If your driver's license is about to expire, Make sure you get it renewed before you buy a home. Also, make sure you do your 2020 taxes if you haven't done them yet. Very, very important. And that is pretty much the gist of that and the home buying process. So here's my information. Feel free to take a picture with your phone. If you have any questions, send me an email, shoot me a text. I am more than happy to help all of you. And um, again, I really appreciate you all letting me be here. I'm going to mute my microphone now and let Quinny to take over. There was no rush at all. <laughs> and and thank you so much, Michael. Um, certainly, uh, while uh, we're switching to Quinita and her presentation, Michael, if you wouldn't mind just putting your contact information in the chat box. Um, again, just a friendly reminder to anyone that has questions um, to please place them in the chat box located in the lower right hand of your corner, the the, cor the right hand corner of your screen at the end of the presentation, um, both Quanita and Michael will have an opportunity to answer them. All right, sorry for the delay. Good evening. I am Juanita Kareem, the compliance officer for the Department of Housing and Community Development. And April is a lot of things. It's fair housing, it's money matters, and it is also one of our favorite times, which is um, open enrollment for the moderate income housing unit program. Um, I will shorten that to say MIHU throughout this uh, presentation. Just a brief overview of what the program is. So why are MIHUs required in Howard County? It is in our county code. It is required of any developer to provide uh, 10 to 18 percent of any new for sale and rental um, units for moderate income housing folks. What is moderate income? <clears throat> and we calculate everything based upon a percentage of what the area median income. So the area median income for 2021 for Howard County 
is 117,730 for a four person family. 80% is what we use for moderate income to purchase a home. So a, a family of four cannot make any more than 94,184. And based upon how many people live in your household, uh, you can see home ownership versus rental. Rental is based upon 60%. I'm not gonna get into that too much. So I said, this is an open enrollment period. Um, this is what our home ownership application looks like. Just a snippet of it. Um, we also have it in electronic form and I'll provide the links for that um, down the road, but you, you must fill out an application. Uh, the most important thing I want you to, to focus on is the last page of that application that tells you what kind of documentation you need. The signed application itself, uh, recent pay stubs, any other income documentation for other persons in your household. Um, we do know that, you know, I think I just read today that uh, the deadline for this year for your taxes got extended to like May something, but um, it's, it's good to get your taxes in again, as Mike said, as soon as you can, because we do look at that information on our end as well to see what you can qualify for. If you have um, college students in the home and they're over the age of 18, then we'll give you an affidavit that says, you know, they're a full-time student, they shouldn't, we don't count their income. Otherwise, if there's a 25 year old living in your house and they're working and they're out of college, their income will count. So, like I said, applications are accepted um, four times during the year, January, April, which is now through April 30th, 31st at five o'clock. It does shut down at five o'clock. And then again in October, you want to be mortgage ready. So yeah, talking to a lender ahead of time to know what you might even be pre-qualified for. You'll then get to uh, go into our database and we'll, as units become available, we pick people to go see the homes. They are new and some are what we consider a resale because the person who has already been awarded an MIHU will live in their home, outgrow it and want to sell it. You have to come back to us to sell it. So we have sometimes what's called a lottery. That doesn't mean you get the house for free. It simply means you are the chosen um, number one person. We often uh, choose an alternate as a backup. And that's just because people sometimes something may happen with the credit or the, the mortgage. And if they can't go forward, at least we'll still have an alternate. Once you are actually selected for a property, you have to um, attend a one-on-one -on -one session for everyone who's gonna be signing all the documents. You then sign a sales contract, um, get everything finalized with your lender, and then the title company, as during COVID right now, most of our title companies are asking for that earnest money deposit um, by wire and electronic funds and things. Once your loan is approved, then you go through settlement, but you got to go through all those other st steps with the loan officer, like Mike or someone else. The resale the, on the new property, you don't have to um, pay for an inspection or anything like that because they just had um, approvals through our department of licensing and permits. So theoretically, the house is the way it's supposed to be, and it meets all the codes. But if you're going to purchase a resale, you have an opportunity to get a home inspection and then the owners have to um, fix and repair anything that could be of health and safety or um, things that may have changed during the code building code since they purchased the home. Once you become a homeowner, an MIHU homeowner, that is, you must live in it as your primary residence can never rent it out. Um, you must pay all the condo and association fees and abide by all their bylaws. You usually get that at the beginning during contract time to know whether or not you can act, you want to even live under those kind of regimes. Uh, you are responsible for your own maintenance and repairs and, and it's good to keep the house 
livable because if this is your first, you might want to grow to a, another one. You might not pay off that 30 year mortgage. Um, and then annually you will receive a letter from me that says, I do still live here. Um, I'm not renting out my home, but if I ever get a return letter, then I might start investigating to make sure that you are still living there. This is one of our new, um, I believe this is Blue Stream at Delacour um, in, Ox in a Elk Ridge area. Wouldn't you love to live and have that space in your kitchen? I could entertain there like really well. <laughs> um, right now, we have some two and three bedroom condominiums and there are some three and four bedroom townhouses. They are in these communities, as I just said, uh, that is Delacorn and Blue Stream and Elk Ridge. There's some in Laurel, Hanover, um, Columbia, all over Howard County, except for the uh, western part of Howard County. The resales, they come as people decide they wanna sell them, the new ones. We usually know a little bit ahead of time when um, builders are deciding to give us what they call a priority period. And that means that we have 120 days from when we price the houses to um, find buyers. So hopefully there's some eligible buyers out there now that are listening and will go to our website later and apply. Uh oh, come on, use the arrow. <clears throat> some miscellaneous item, items about the process. Um, Please be sure to complete the application because if you miss some information or you miss spots on the pages, it will be returned to you. Uh, the timeline, of, as I said, for the um, buildings, we we knew we typically know when they're going to be coming from the new builders, but not for resale. Um, we don't. We can't actually tell you. Oh, tomorrow I'm going to have X Y Z house. Um, so people often want to know, well, how long am I going to be in the database? Why have I been there that long? We we base everything on what house we have available. And then we pull people according to your income and your family size and um, what you can afford. On average, we sell about 40 units per year. And we do have a great down payment assistance program that can help first time home buyers for up to 25,000. There is some programs that that can be a little bit more, but that would mean your income is um, a little less than the norm. Once you do apply, please keep your information up to date. If you move, if you change your email address, things like that, because if we don't keep up with you and if you get a, a raise or something, that's the best thing to tell us. Um, uh, because everything's based upon your income that could put you in a bracket for different houses. Um, and we like for you to tell a friend and tell a friend and tell a coworker. <laughs> this is another beautiful property. Look at that. Would you love a fireplace on your deck? I mean, it's just, I want to be there right now <laughs> on a wet day. Our department um, has a lot of programs and those that are based on home ownership and, and all would include our SDLP, which is settlement down payment loan. We do have our own um, first time home buyer education class, which is a six hour class. It's virtual right now. And then you have to do a two hour individual one on one with uh, a counselor. Once you do have a home and hopefully you don't have this problem too soon, we have now a foreclosure prevention program. And then um, for older homes, it's called reinvest, renovate, restore, where we provide um, help for if, you, if your grandmother might need her new need a new roof or a ramp or some other work, tell them we do a lot for people. So again, the, right now April is open enrollment. Uh, it's best if you do the electronic version. And this is the website, howardcountymd.gov forward slash M-I-H-U underscore open enrollment. Um, our offices, counting offices are still closed to the public right now, but you can mail it. We do have people that are going in sometimes and checking the mail, um, especially right now, of course. 
but um, the easier way is to do the electronic portion, but have your documents in a PDF prior to getting on because then that makes the ease of you um, going through the computer system. And that is really all I have to say for um, program purposes. I don't know if we have been getting any questions um, or anything in the chat I don't see. Well, I'll, I'll just pause right there for um, for anyone that may want to put some questions in the chat box. A lot of wonderful, great information. So I want to just um, you know thank you, Michael and Juanita, for joining us for a wealth of information. Um, I do see a question that just popped up in the chat box, um, and so that question is for um, and it just states, "What is first home buyer's fee structure for loans?" So, Michael, I don't know if that question is for you. That's for him. Yes, it's first. Oh, time. yeah, sounds like for me. Um, so it's going to depend. You know, we don't charge uh, like an origination fee as a percentage of a loan. Um, I don't want to quote something exactly off the top of my head at the risk of being inaccurate, but. I think our loan fees are, are generally around 14, $1,500 is all we charge as a lender. Um, sometimes if it's a down payment assistance program, there may be other costs involved. Um, there is a lot of flexibility though. Sometimes you're able to get money credited back. Uh, typically when you're purchasing a home, um, there is about 4% of the purchase price on the high end of closing costs. That's going to include lender fees, appraisal, title fees, transfer taxes, and prepaids as well. And also title insurance, which is optional, but I always recommend. You're welcome, Julie. Feel free to uh, send me an email if you want a, a little bit of a more in-depth answer. So we're just going to keep pausing. This session is, of course, for you. So um, as participants, if you have any questions that you would like to ask either privately um, or, you know, for the panelists, please feel free to put them in the chat box. I don't know if that means the presentations were just that good. <laughs> they, like, <laughs> I, I will take the silence. As, <laughs> absolutely, I will take the silence as as a wonderful presentation. Um, you know, I'll I'll go ahead and and ask um a, a question just kind of to tease everything. Um, and and this question is is for Michael. Um, if you're looking to purchase a home and you do need to repair your credit, is there a certain time frame that you should be looking at to kind of work backwards? Um, for example, if you're looking to purchase a home in the next year um, and you need to make some adjustments to your credit, um, do you have any recommendations for individuals? I do. So regardless of what your time frame is, you should be looking at your credit today tomorrow. I mean, immediately. Um, there's different lengths of time it's going to take to repair credit, and that's going to just depend on everybody's unique situation. Someone who doesn't have any lines of credit may need to go to their bank and get a secured credit card and have that report with all three of the barrows. That could take months to a year to even get your credit, you know, into a place where your scores are all reporting it in a qualifying spot. If you just have a lot of high balance credit cards, it could be as simple as paying them all down to, you know, specified amounts. Um, so everyone's time frame is kind of different, but I would recommend again speaking to a loan officer or going to annualcreditreport.com and kind of following some of that guidance because. No matter what you're doing in life, financially, the stronger your credit is, the, the, the better offers you're going to get, whether that's a home, whether that's a car, line of credit, et cetera. 
Thank you, Michael. Um, and, and just because last week um, for our money matters workshop was dedicated on budget. Um, and then, of course, this week is focused on home ownership. I was just wondering if you had um, any guidance for those that are tuning in on what percentage of the budget um, an individual should be looking to pay towards their mortgage. Absolutely. So do you mean what percentage of what they have in assets or are you speaking more um, of their their what monthly payment to look for versus their monthly expenses? So I'm looking more towards budgeting, right? So from a money matters aspect, we want to be very um, supportive of individuals. So even though you may qualify for a larger loan, um, just from a budgetary perspective, if there's a particular um, recommendation that you have that people should be mindful of minimum of this and a maximum of that from a, a mortgage. Yeah, so I really like when people are at, this might be a little confusing. 35% of your gross monthly income minus your credit obligations. So let's say you made $10,000 per month before taxes. 35% of that would be $3,500. Let's say you had a $500 car payment. You'd subtract that to get you down to $3,000. Let's say your student loans are another $500 a month. We'd subtract that. And I would think $2,500 would probably be a budget friendly place. What I also do is I encourage people to think into the future. Are you going to have to buy a car? Are you going to be incurring any large expenses that you can think of in the next five to 10 years? You should be budgeting for that in advance. You also don't want to be house poor where you can only afford to make your mortgage payment and you can't afford to put money aside. So you should really look at your overall expenses and you should be able to continue to save money while paying your bills on top of your mortgage payment. Very, very important because Lord knows that if something like COVID is to happen and you are in a tough financial situation, you wanna be able to have some reserves in the bank. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. Um, there is another question from the chat box. Uh, do you work with other programs such as teachers next door, nurses next door, and how does that factor into the loan process? So I work with all sorts of programs. Um, I am familiar with those and how it factors into the loan process. So uh, essentially what I have to do is I have to take uh, that full application and gather all of the documents. And then like Quinita was explaining for MIHU, there's household income requirements. There's typically those types of household income requirements or individual income requirements with any sort of assistance program. So I have to thoroughly go through all your financial documents. I have to look up their charts. I have to look up average median income charts and use those to determine what you would qualify for. On top of that, whenever you're doing any sort of uh, program that's going to provide a grant or any sort of assistance, it's going to require a secondary underwrite. So, in that chart I had earlier, where we go from processing to underwriting, we're going to go from processing to underwriting to that program's underwriting back to our underwriters, then to closing. So it just adds a little bit of an extra layer. It can extend the amount of time you need to close into more of that 45 day range instead of that 30 day range. Great. Um, so we have another question from the chat box. Um, it says there are pricing distortions due to COVID related low inventory. Is this the time to act or wait? If waiting, how long to wait? I'm going to look into my crystal ball for this one. Uh, so that's a tough question and that's one I get very often. And here is how I approach that question. The first thing I ask you is what are you currently paying per month in rent? If you're paying $3,000 per month in rent, and you're looking at a $350,000 house, you're gonna be saving money by making that purchase. If you're living with your parents paying nothing in rent, 
that's going to be a pretty big swing to go from a $0 to maybe a $2,000 payment. The real question on top of that is how long do you plan on being in that home for? Because homes tend to appreciate, like I said at the beginning, 3.5% per year. Now, it's not going to look like that. It's typically going to look more like that. But if you plan to be in a home for 10, 15 years, even five years, and you're already paying a hefty enough amount in rent, I would say yes, it's probably a good time to act. If you're looking to buy a home for maybe the next two or three years, it could be a time to wait. Um, what I do for all my buyers is I pull up forecast charts based on what you tell me you're looking to do. Um, other factors go into that as well, um, as far as the current situation you're in. Someone who has four kids in a two bedroom apartment where the kids don't have space to, to, to play, you know, they're, they're probably ready to make a move because that space and that stability for the family may be more important than potentially waiting for a market to dip. Um, there's also a shortage of lumber right now and lumber prices are through the roof, which is a whole nother aspect to it. But most analysts are predicting that the housing market is gonna continue to increase. Um, like I said, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, so I would really look into what's your long-term picture. You know, if you're gonna be there for a while, it's generally a good time to buy. Thank good, you, Michael. good question, by the way. I love that one. Very good question indeed. Uh, Juanita, I think the next question might actually be for you. It says, does MIHU offer workshops on the programs? Yes, we do. Um, we had halted in person, of course, um, for a while and had our first virtual workshop um, last week. So we do plan to do some more. Um, stay tuned. We'll, we'll put it out on social media and, and on our website. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question um, just talks about what services are offered for the home buying process if English is not my first language. And before I turn it over, and I don't know whether this is for Michael, what I will say is in addition to tonight's session, uh, we will be holding a complimentary, complimentary session tomorrow night on the same topic in Spanish. Um, so if you go to our website, www howardcountymd.gov slash money matters. If you are uh, Spanish speaking and you wanna participate in that session, then certainly click on that. Uh, if you're not able to tune in, then certainly following our session, uh, we will upload that to the website. So with that, I will turn it over. Michael, I don't know if you have a, a quick answer for that. So, I mean, the same programs are available. Um, we have Spanish speaking loan originators. I don't know how many other languages that we have people that are fluent in. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head if we have how many different languages we have the ability to send out disclosures in. So my answer to that would be the same products are available regardless of what your primary language is. However, depending on the lender and the loan officer, they may only be able to send you documents in English. Um, so I would do some research regarding your primary language and perhaps what company has someone who has the ability to send out your legal disclosures in your native language, because there are specific requirements to be licensed to do that. I'll piggyback on that just a little bit for, um... Anything that we provide through the county, we do have a language assistance, um, language access policy that we have to provide things um, in other forms of languages, depending on whether it's written or verbal. And we, um, as you see, we have ASL as well. So, but we, the county has to make sure that we have um, most of our things in other languages. So. You'll get it from us. 
Yeah, absolutely. And building upon what Quinita had just mentioned, I did put my contact information in the chat box, both my email and my phone number. If um, you have any questions or you have specific needs and don't know where to turn, feel free to just shoot me an email or give me a call and I'm happy to talk that through with you. Um, but we do have another question from the chat box. It says, what if the bank appraisal on the house is less than the asking price? That's a great question, Hannah. So that's going to depend. Uh, that's gonna a popular answer from me here. Uh, everything always seems to depend. So as far as lending goes from a mortgage lender perspective, we do not have the ability to lend more than the appraised value. We can either lend the purchase price or the appraised value, the lower of the two. So, this is why it's really important to have an experienced realtor who really knows what they're doing and can explain the contingencies to you. In this market, we are often seeing people waiving their appraisal contingency. And in those situations, they're often choosing to pay the difference in cash. So, let's say we offered $400,000 on a house with no appraisal contingency, and it came back at $390,000, your option in that situation would be either to pay an extra $10,000 out of pocket or to walk away from the contract and forfeit your earnest money deposit. Now, if you had that same offer in place, but you had an appraisal contingency, you would be protected which means you would have the ability to walk away from the contract and keep your earnest money, or the seller could drop the purchase price to the appraised value. Really good question. I hope that answer helped you. That was a really good question. And in fact, in real life, that is actually what happened to me. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't, it certainly wasn't by much, um, but we were able, because I did have that appraisal contingency, we were able to drop it. It was just a couple thousand, but every couple thousand uh, certainly does work. So, uh, so with that, that actually brings us to 8 p.m. Um, and, you know, what I'll, what I'll do is I will pause uh, both Juanita and I have placed our contact information in the chat box. I know that Michael has shared his information as well so that you're able to connect with him. Um, and so what I will just say is a, a just a, a, a thank you to both Michael and Juanita for their wonderful and thoughtful presentation. A lot of great, helpful information. And thank you also to all those who joined us tonight for an engaging conversation. If you would like to connect with any of us offline, of course, again, our information is in the chat box. And for those that who would like to view this video at a later time, the presentation following tonight's meeting will be uploaded to our Money Matters website. During the month of April, we do celebrate financial literacy and we will be hosting a series of Money Matters workshops to provide you with helpful tools to manage your finances effectively and create a pathway towards financial empowerment and success. You can learn more and register for our other um, Money Matters workshops on our website. On behalf of Howard County Executive Calvin Ball and our entire Money Matters planning team, we thank you for joining in to tonight's Money Matters workshop on home ownership. Thank you so much. And that concludes our presentation this evening. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>